I remember staying in a tent outside solo for the first time in my life. Do you remember that experience in your own life? I was eight years old, and it was in the backyard of my home. When I say solo, I mean no parents. My younger brother Mike and my neighbor friend Mike were staying with me. We built a fire under our parents' supervision, cooked hot dogs on a stick with all the trimmings, and topped off the evening with roasted marshmallows melted into Hershey's milk chocolate slapped between two graham crackers. It's called a s'more, and the reason if you've ever had one, you know why it's called that, because when you eat one, you want some more. All right, you guys are good. After cleaning up, our parents left, and it was time to bed down. We were good boys, and we went right to sleep. Wrong. We started talking and laughing and burping, and okay, you get the idea. When we had no sooner fallen off to sleep, we were awakened by something that hit our tent. We didn't know what it was. And we really didn't want to find out what it was. Our tent was secure, buttoned down for the night. And then another something hit our tent. What was going on? Is something dropping from the persimmon tree? We were right in the middle of a fruit orchard. We had seven apple trees, three persimmon trees, two peach trees, and a cherry tree. We were right underneath between two persimmon trees. I thought, no. Persimmons have been harvested. That can't be persimmons. A third bomb hit our tent and then a fourth. We were under attack. We did not know who was out there or what was attacking us or how we were going to defend ourselves. My neighbor Mike, who was a bit older than me, slowly began to unzip the bottom part of the door to the tent. We made our way out of the tent on our bellies, like all good Cub Scouts would do as we were. What do you think we did next? Well, the plan was to crawl on our bellies all the way to the back door of our house, which is about 40 yards. Well, what happened was we were two feet out and another one of those something hit me in the back of the leg. I jumped to my feet, screamed at the top of my lungs, and sprinted to the back door. I went to a safe place. I went to the place that I knew I could be protected. I'm going to stop there and not tell you the rest of the story. I'll tell you a little bit later. Fast forward five years, and it was time to go camping again. Alone, but this time in the woods, with our parents some five miles away instead of 40 yards. I was so much older and wiser now that I was 13. So, Here it was, early April, me and four other boys made preparations for a night on a secluded lake in a wooded area. It was off-road about a half a mile, but Jerry's dad drove his truck with all of our stuff over the train to arrive at our campsite. It was after basketball season, beginning of April, and before baseball season, at least it wasn't a pandemic year, so we knew when the seasons were. It was time for some fresh outdoors camping with the boys. The cooler was stocked with 7-Up and A&W root beer. We were set for the night. Our dads had made sure we'd build a safe fire, and we assured them we would put it out properly before we went to sleep. You have to remember, this is the late 60s, so there was no cell phones, no tracking devices, no electricity where we were going. Our dads were to pick us up at 9 o'clock the next morning. Now, it got dark early in April because this was the day before daylight savings time back when it actually happened in the first part of April. So by 9 p.m., we had been, had two hours of darkness. Uh, We kept building the fire, playing war with a deck of cards, but it was getting colder. So it was time to let the fire go down and hunker down in our warm tent and climb into our sleeping bags. Once we got into the tent and secured it for the night, we did the usual talking and laughing and burping and making other sounds, which boys make, and finally fell off to sleep. It was a few hours later, but it was well after midnight that I was awakened by the 10-year-old in our group. His name was Jay, 
And Jay said, David, David, what's going on? The tent is collapsing. Well, I was on one side of the tent. He was on the other side of the tent. And the tent was deeply bowed downward and inward. And I said, Jay, just let's push. On, see, what's, see, what this, see what's happening. So we both pushed on the tent. And it went back to normal. I fell back asleep because I'm 13 and I need my rest. About a half an hour later, Jay, David, David, our, what's, what's going on? Again, same, same place, same happened again. We did the same thing. We were buttoned down. We were secure. Parents were going to be there at 9 o'clock. Let's just stay in. Let's not find out what's going on out there. Okay, I'll come back to that a little bit later. You know, I'm here today to encourage and to exhort you with the Word of God to look up. Uh, this is, I feel like this is the third sermon today. Jake, Steve, great. You, great intros. You used my scripture, my, uh, some of my points, which, which is awesome, isn't it? We, we didn't connect with each other at all, so God knows what he's doing. Um, God's on the throne. He's smiling at us right now. He's delighting us. He loves us. And he wants to give us what we need in the moment we need it. And we might not think it's that moment, but he'll give it to us when we need it. And for you, it might be right now. He will restore you. He will renew your strength. He will replenish anything you've lost and make it even better, fuller, greater. And that's why I think it's so important for us to answer this question. Who is your rock? Who is your rock? Who do you lean on in a pandemic? Who do you trust in an election year? <laughs> How do you respond to racial injustice? What do you got in your backpack when you're going backpacking in this game of life? Now, really the only thing you need to go backpacking is this thing, right? Or and to go camping. You just need this all-purpose knife. Well, that's in the physical. Well, this is in the physical too. Um, Man, I was going to have a kid come up and help me do this. I don't know. This is, what is this? It's a rock. That's what we need in this pandemic, in this fighting social just, or racial justice, injustice. In election year, we need a rock. Who is your rock? We have a memory verse today. 1 Samuel 2.2. 2. I want to have you say it with me. Go ahead and go to the, that next slide. There we go. There is no one holy like the Lord. Yeah, say it with me. There is no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. That last line again together. There is no rock like our God. Now, in the background of that, Sandy just took that picture last week. We were out in Colorado with our, at our niece's wedding. This is the balanced rock. It's a 700-ton red sandstone ballerina perched on its tiptoes in the heart of the Garden of the Gods. It's unique. It's not like any other rocks you'll find in any other place, kind of like our God. There's no rock like our God. With the uncertainty of our times, I find it so very important that the believer finds his footing in the rock of his salvation, the chief cornerstone, Jesus Christ. When we discover the foundation of our lives in Jesus, we'll be able to face adversity and challenges of great magnitude. We're reaching new pinnacles of struggle and adversity in which we've never seen in our lifetime, yet it's not like it's not happened in history with genocides and ethnic cleansings and holocausts and plagues at the end of World War I and so on and so on and so on. We could go these kinds of challenges others have faced in history. But perhaps in our lifetime we have not seen this ever before. I know this. 
God was not surprised by COVID-19. His plans and purposes will not be thwarted, altered, or stopped by this pandemic. The coronavirus is not an obstacle for our God to accomplish His will, and here is His will, to bring ultimate glory to His name in all the earth. What do you do when you think you're in trouble? When you have something's coming out of the air and hitting your tent? What do you do when you know you're in trouble? Well, the lesson I learned when I was eight years old was this, I run to the rock. I run to that safe place. I run to the rock of ages. My parents cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. And so today when I'm in trouble, today when I face what I face, I run to the rock, the rock of ages. You know, the biblical David spent 10 years outmaneuvering the enemy by living in caves and crevices of the rock. Psalm 40 Verses 1 through 4a, I think, is the next passage of Scripture. And this is kind of the setting for him. And he says this, I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. The most significant. Sometimes we say the least we can do, but I think it's the most we can do, as Steve was leading us today in prayer, is to be on our knees. As a church, probably even more significant and will make our time together more significant if we are in our private place on our knees, crying out to our God, our Father. He lifted me and he set me, he heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit. And David, this was an experience for him, out of the mud and mire, and he set my feet on a rock. And he gave me a firm place to stand. That's why we have no rock like our God. It's a firm place. It's a sure place. It's a safe place for us to be. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust. Now, How do you prepare for what you cannot see coming? How many in this room would have predicted the world would be wearing masks? Everybody got theirs? If you're going to go to Kroger or Meyer or any public place, you better have it ready. Who would have predicted that we would have to have those things a year ago? Even six months ago at this point in time. But it's, we don't see an end. We don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. But my answer to the question, how do you prepare for what you cannot see coming, is this. You know who your rock is. You know how much it weighs. You know what it's made of. You know what it can provide for you. And you know what it wants from you. You know who your rock is. My God is my rock. And Jake shared this scripture, but I'm going to go Back to it in Psalm 46 in the next slide. And I'm just going to read it from up here. God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging, there is a river <laughs> whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. Next slide. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar. No more true than it could be today. Kingdoms fall. He lifts His voice. The earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see the works of the Lord, the desolations He has brought on the earth. Next slide. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. Cease striving. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in all the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob 
is our fortress. That's just the whole sermon right there in, in itself, is it not? Go ahead and go to the next slide. First Peter was written to encourage Christians under the threat of violent persecution. The first century Christians knew what pandemics, pandemic pluses were, that what they faced. Um, John MacArthur writes a commentary on the first Peter entitled, Courage in Times of Trouble. And just four or five verses I'm going to share from first Peter really speak to, um, to the reality of, of what we're in right now. I'm going to go ahead and go there as well. First Peter 4, 7 says, The end of all things is near, therefore be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. The NIV says the end of all things is near, therefore be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. Peter shares uh, the reality, gives an exhortation, and declares a purpose. The reality is the end of all things is near. He spoke that 2,000 years ago. The only thing I want to say about that is we're 2,000 years closer to the end. But in thinking about this, I, I thought this. I want to be, what, what do you want to be caught doing when it's the end? What, do you, what values do you want to be upholding at the end? What do you want your hands and your, to be doing? What do you want, where do you want your feet to be going? What do you want your mouth to be saying when it's the end? The end of all things is near, so my exhortation is watch out. Open up your eyes. And then he gives an exhortation. The same verse. This is the three-point sermon right here. Therefore, be of sound judgment and sober spirit. Be clear-minded and self-controlled. Be alert and fully sober. Another passage, another translation. Wake up. Shannon prayed this in her prayer. Wake us up, Lord. May we be fully, may we be clear-minded. May we not miss what you have to say to us, what you have for us, what you want us to be doing amidst storms, amidst pandemics, amidst challenges that are coming seemingly from every side. Wake us up. And then the exhortation has been given by Steve already. He declares a purpose. The reason we need, he wants to put us in this position, the reason he wants us to watch out and wake up is that so we can cry out. It's for the purpose of prayer, to pray real, heartfelt prayers. And I think they begin in our closets. They begin at home, and they will come forth as we gather as the body of Christ. We need to pray real, heartfelt prayers. Father, our country is in trouble, as we've already prayed this morning. Father, our cities are in trouble. Father, our police force is in trouble. God, help us. In a classic passage in 2 Chronicles 20, there's the prayer of Jehoshaphat. A massive army was closing in on his forces, and he called the nation to prayer. It's not surprising that in times of war, some of the most impassioned prayers of the heart have been prayed. The annuals of Russian history tell us that pivotal turning point when Napoleon had surrounded Moscow, and indeed its spires were being torched and burned, knowing he was on the verge of humiliation and defeat, the Tsar was on his face before God in a church in St. Petersburg, pleading for God to save his nation. This czar was not a devout man with a natural bent for prayer by no stretch of the imagination. In fact, he had lived an immoral and disreputable life. Earlier, he had intentionally appointed a vile man as archbishop in the hope of gaining an ally in his own wicked lifestyle. But God works through the schemes and ploys of political demagogues. May he do it again and again and again. And after taking office, the archbishop no longer wanted to mock God. 
in a completely surprising move to all, he surrendered his life to Christ. Now, you did hear that right. An archbishop surrendered his life to Christ. It just seems like maybe he should have already done that, being in the position he was. But it's true and happens even in our day. As the nation tottered on the brink of defeat, the czar himself sought God in repentance and prayer, the most unlikely candidate. God answered his plea, and he sent a minor, minor prophet, Winter, one of the coldest in the history of Russia, and the rest is history. On February 24, 1986, the history of the Filipino people records the same cry of desperation. 800 soldiers were open targets before President Ferdinand Marcos Air Force. Nervously, they stood watching these aircraft hover over them and knowing that their attempt at a peaceful revolution could end in moments with their small army being blown apart. But they were not just standing there. They were being led in scripture reading and prayer. Sure that the end was near, General Ernesto Isleto was reading to them from Psalm 91. Do I have Psalm 91 up? Yes. And he read like this, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God whom I trust. He will cover you with His feathers and under His wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. Even as they heard the word of the Lord being read to them, the whirring of the encroaching aircraft overhead grew louder. But something was happening of which they were not aware. As the planes came closer, instead of wiping out this meager handful on the ground, one by one, the pilots defected and landed. That story of the bloodless revolution is now history, too. In the Persian Gulf War in 1991, General Norman Schwarzkopf was at the helm of the greatest firepower ever brought under the command of one man. Many of us, many of us were alive, not all of us. He has gone on record saying that even at the stealth, as the stealth bombers were closing in on their targets to begin the war, he was in prayer. It is time for such a time as this, as David prayed, to cry out heartfelt prayers to our rock and our Redeemer, our Almighty God. So it's true that we're in a time of confrontation with a bigger enemy than COVID-19 or racial injustice, even though those are battles we are facing. But in jo Joseph Hatt's instant, in Second Chronicles 20, it was more than the battle in front of him and his army. If you read the story, there's something profoundly theological in the very content of his prayer. This was more than just a cry for help or for victory. This was a plea that those who were in the thick of this conflict would know who God was. Jehoshaphat did not just ask for intervention. He sought the very person and presence of God. Only in that context did he believe he would find victory in his own life before any victory in battle. Should we think any less? Will we find true victory in the battles that we face unless we have a personal and intimate relationship with God and seek the very person and presence of God? Second Chronicles 26 says, O Lord, God of our fathers, are you not the God who is in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. Power and might are in your hand and no one can withstand you. He cries out in this prayer, Who are you, God? Are you not? Have you ever prayed that prayer? You're in the midst of this thing and you can hardly see it about you, but you say, God, where are you? Or are you not? Begin proclaiming the things that you do know. You're not experiencing perhaps them at that moment, but proclaim who you know God is. So it's a good thing to be prepared for that time by getting to know Him better now. Joseph finishes this prayer in verse 12 by saying, we do not know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. <laughs> what do you do when you're in trouble? What do you do when you don't see what's coming next? You fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith. 
He's the one that's placed that in you. And we don't try to do it on our own strength or knowledge or wisdom, even though I see a lot of smart people out there. You've you got a lot of good stuff. But God has everything you're going to need for wisdom, for strength, for power, for words in the times that we're facing. Are your eyes on the rock? Can you even see it? It's kind of low. Sorry, I should have given it, put it a little bit higher. Are your eyes on the rock? What does he expect from us? What does God ask from us? Peter, who was called the Petros, the little rock, has something to say about that in the next verses. I think it's just all right there. Verse 8, he says, Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another because love covers a multitude of sins. It's already been prayed this morning. Love. Love each other. Love those around you. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love God. Love others. Love deeply and love completely. Above all, keep your fervent in your love for one another because love covers a multitude of sin. Oh God, how can we show your love to those around us? You know, this time, this 2020, as we have had relationships with churches, we have, they, their testimony, and, you, and I pray our testimony here as well, is that it's really become, it's made life pretty real. <laughs> it's, it's like people are falling on all kinds of the sides of fences that we didn't have these fences before. And we're have, being challenged to love. Love deeply. Love completely. In the next verse he says, be hospitable to one another without complaint. Share with one another without grumbling. Verse 9. We're challenged in this time to share joyfully with what we have to share. This can be financially. This can be what we have God has, uh, has us. We, you know, I have had conversations with my neighbor more than I have probably in the 30 years that we've lived there. Now, big reason is because uh, we're home. <laughs> we're, we're not in Poland during the summer. But it's the, our neighbor started a new garden. Um, it's kind of it's progressive. I don't want, I'm not going to go into the explanation of it. I don't even know how, how it works. But in our backyard, socially distanced, wonderful, and had conversations. We've not had those conversations because... They didn't have a garden in their backyard, and we weren't there. Share joyfully. And then the next verse, here, here we go. This is what God is asking us to do, to not only love deeply and completely, share joyfully, but in verse 10, as each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Whoever speaks is to do it as one who is speaking the very utterances of God. Whoever serves is to do it as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies. We have an opportunity to contribute powerfully, to speak the very words of God, to serve faithfully. And it's not on our own strength. It's not about who we are. It's about who God is. It's about who our rock is and what He gives to us. He gives us the strength. He gives us the words, the very oracles of God. God will show up in the most, what we think is inopportune times. We really don't want God to show up in that moment, but then He does. Praise God that He's ready when we are, have an open heart and open mind to receive all that He wants for us to speak and to share, contribute powerfully. And in verse 11, why does, why does God want us to love deeply and share joyfully and contribute powerfully, it's because the, His ultimate goal in all things is that God may be praised and honored through Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Who is your rock? God is my rock in my salvation. In Him, I fully trust. You know, it's... Uh, the girls, the girls, the young ladies, thanks for leading us in worship this morning. I'm probably going to get uh, a little weak here, but I'm looking back at Tracy and Ad Adriana. I remember the day 
of Adriana's birth. Wasn't that a proud day for Rick and for Tracy? Yeah? You know, it, in the spirit and seeing Adriana lead worship, the, the proud just gets bigger, doesn't it? <laughs> I have three children. I've been a proud father from time to time. Probably more so than I should have been. But you know what? We're proud sons and daughters of our Heavenly Father. I should have had this memorized because now I can't see. Because I want to brag a little bit on our Heavenly Father as a son of His. Because my God can do anything. He can create something out of nothing. He can slay giants with a single stone. He can shut mouths of lions. He can open prison doors. He can break bars of irons. He can mend a broken heart. He can forgive all my failures. He can renew my strength so that I can soar on wings like eagles. My God can do anything. He can walk upon the water. He can ride upon the clouds. He can part the mighty waters. He can calm the raging, a raging sea. He can rain fire down from heaven. He can save from the fiery furnace. He can turn deserts into rivers. He can turn water into wine. My God can do anything. He can make a king look like a beast. He can make a beast speak like a man. He can send demons into pigs. He can place coins in the mouths of fish. He can rule the kingdoms of the earth. He can change the plans of nations. He can know the thoughts of every man. He can see their every deeds. My God can do anything. He can fix a broken marriage. He can heal the deepest wound. He can take a hopeless situation and fill it full of hope. He can take what's dead and lifeless and make it alive again. He can take a heart that's hard as stone and make it soft like flesh. He can take our uncertainties and give us blessed assurance. He can make the lame to walk. He can cause the blind to see. He can pull out us out of a pit and set us high on a rock. He can help us overcome every adversity we face. He can help us conquer our every fear. He can lead us in victory amidst a pandemic. He can remain calm amidst the storm. He can rise above the coronavirus and see us all the way to the finish line. My God can do anything. My God is my rock. Who is your rock? Let's stand and be prepared to sing, but I want to tell you the rest of the story. It was something that was hitting our tent when I was eight years old. They were dirt clods. There were two teenage boys out in the cornfield in our backyard, and uh, they were throwing dirt clods at us. Harmless, really. Um, when we ran, and this did wake up my parents, and they, uh, you know, we lived, in, we lived in Hicksville. We lived in the boonies. So my dad got a shotgun as did the neighbor, and dad didn't shoot his gun, but at the, the end of the air he shot his shotgun, and so these two boys came out. <laughs> they showed themselves. I just wanted to say this about them. One was Larry Cruz, who's now for over 30 years been the head elder at a local Christian church up city away. The other one has been the senior pastor at Concord Christian for 20 years. Redemption. And God, God works in, in, in wonderful ways. And so the, the, the second story, what was on our tent? It was early April. We had four inches of snow that night. And, you know, the weather, you don't have weather.com to check and click. And, uh, but when we, when we woke up, and the, our dads were there at, at dawn, uh, about 7 o'clock when the sun came up, to, ready to take us away. But we had to carry all of our stuff a half mile through the snow because they couldn't do the train because they didn't know where the rocks and ditches and all that were. We didn't see what was coming. We didn't know what was there, but 
That's a lot like us. We don't know a lot of things. I mean, this, this past six months has taught me I know very, very little. <laughs> but I do know some things. I know who my rock is. I know the strength he provides me, and he has provided me in the past. And I'm trusting him for today and for every day going forward. My prayer is for you as well. That everything, that you're all in for God Almighty, the rock, who will make you stand, give you a safe place, and give you a refuge. Be a fortress that you'll be protected no matter what comes your way. Even if death comes our way. Father in heaven, thank you for being our rock. Thank you for being a stronghold, our fortress. You are our God in whom we trust. And God, if we're here this morning and we need to give something over to you, if we need to offer something up to you, God, would you encourage us, I encourage every person in this place to do it. Where they sit, if they want to come to the altar, may, they, may you give them that direction to do what is best so that you might be honored, you might be praised, you might be glorified. In Jesus' name, my rock, our rock and redeemer, we pray.